Hello, Ed. Hi, Margo. How are you doing? I'm all right. Good. Glad to hear it. I thought I might have been in the wrong room because usually I'm not the first one here. Well, I clicked on the link that I copied over onto our session page and it took me somewhere where I didn't think that it should. So I had to go back. So I had to go back to the planning session where that generic link had been posted and that worked. So I guess I screwed it up when I copied it and edited it. I wonder if the links are different. Let me take a quick look at that just in case anybody else is clicking onto it. Right. Cause I had gone over, I was looking for what that generic link was and the only place I found it was in that uh, thread on uh, planning and upcoming events. Okay, let's see. And I thought I had copied it over. I did some editing after I'd copied it over, so I could have fumble fingered my way into breaking it. So but let me take a look at the actual links. So uh, Jeffrey, how are you doing? Nine four. They are different. They are different. Yes. So let me fix that. Please do. Hello. Hi, Jeffrey. How are you doing? Fine. Good. Uh oh. I like how how the images fade in. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, now that's fixed, and hopefully, I, okay. hopefully I, I went in the right direction. Uh, I'd have to double check. But I guess if you did, did, so you followed the link from the Cosmos Cafe Irreducible Mind topic, is that correct? Yes. Okay. Yes. Oh, I didn't and that know. was the one that took you elsewhere. And that took me off, elsewhere. And you right. got off there and came back here. I did yes. Talk yes. On Tuesday, and it, and it got me to the right place. Okay. Well, I think we're all here. Mm -hmm. I hope we're all here. Doc <laughs> isn't coming today. Uh, uh, he's got a meeting. <laughs> Doug isn't. We're all here. There's a German expression. Um, which means you're not all there. Means you're not all there. Yeah, so that's the question. Are we all here, really? <laughs> so, 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 so we're all here. I don't know. No, we're not all here. We're all here. We may not, not be all here, but we're all in one place. <laughs> we would be dismembered if we weren't. And then we would have to be remembered. <laughs> <laughs> As a group, we are members of the group, so. Yes. <laughs> and are we, rem are we remembered when we leave and then come back again? <laughs> you mean, do we persist? Well, I don't know. I did. <laughs> well, I keep you in my heart. Yeah, okay. <laughs> <clears throat> Good. So, irreducible mind. Mm -hmm. I'd like to share a, a fragmentary report, which yeah. may have bearing on our conversation today. Okay. Uh, I'll just present it as a data, as a, a datum, data mm -hmm. point. I got a ring. I got a pain in my ear, like an earache. And I thought that it was the result of an infection because I've had a little bit of uh, scratchiness in my throat. My wife and the girls have had mild respiratory infections, colds over the past few weeks. So I thought that's what, many, it, what it might be. But as I was meditating and tuning into the feeling, which was a pain in my ear, I began getting for lack of a better word, download of information. Things relating to cosmos, relating to the various details of 
how things connect, the way I, the way things could be. And the more that I listened, the more that came, and I began to feel better actually, as uh, as I resonated with that stream of information. And I'm using this language somewhat hesitantly and reluctantly because all of it gets put into question. I think it gets put into um, uh, the, the kind of critical gaze in this chapter that we read. But after that, and I wrote down a few things and kind of loosely mapped it out because that happens kind of regularly, not the earache, that, that was new. And I remembered something that John had shared about he- hearing re- ringing uh, type of sound. But I got up and I looked um, at my bookshelf and I plucked out The City of God by Augustine, which I've never read. And I know not that much uh, about, really, other than the second hand. It comes in a little bit in Sloterdijk. Uh, and I think it relates a little bit to the video that Johnny shared about um, uh, Oriental, you know, Platonic, Orient, Orient, Oriental Platonism, right? Uh, so I did one of those things, too, that you, Ed, you've talked about, which is you mm-hmm. open to a page and see what's there. And so I opened to a page. And uh, I think it may have bearing on the conversation here. I'd like to share it. Uh, It's about a page long. And so I I would like to read it and then see if there might, if we could draw out the connection between the history that Sloterdijk is talking about, which, you know, Ed, although you haven't been reading Globes, you've Mm -hmm. gotten through osmosis and um, the, the, um, the history that, comes through in, in, the, in the video on Oriental uh, Platonism. Uh, and then this question of the mind and body and the, the, the way that Kelly here in this chapter is proposing a critique of a certain framework of understanding that, uh, that apparent dilemma. Would that be, is that cool with everybody? Oh, okay. sorry. So I'm going to present this and I, I don't want to say that much more about it. Uh, I'd, let, I'd rather just let it, I'd throw, you know, throw it to you uh, to um, go uh, where you will with it, and I'll follow along. So this is page 434 of uh, uh, reference, and this is the modern library edition of uh, The City of God. And I don't know which apostle uh, um, Augustine is referring to here. Uh, But the passage begins, Thus the apostle states that the first man was made in an animal body. For, wishing to distinguish the animal body, which now is from the spiritual, which is to be in the resurrection, he says, It is sown in corruption, it is raised in, in incorruption. It is sown in dishonor, it is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness, It is raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. Then, to prove this, he goes on. There is a natural body and there is a spiritual body. And to show what the animated body is, he says, this is quote, Thus it was written, The first man, Adam, was made a living soul. The last Adam was made a quickening spirit. End of quote. Augustine goes on. He wished thus to show what the animated body is. Though scripture did not say of the first man, Adam, when his soul was created by the breath of God, quote, man was made in an animated body, end quote, but, quote, man was made a living soul, end quote. Augustine continues. By these words, therefore, quote, The first man was made a living soul, end quote. The apostle wishes man's animated body to be understood. But how he wishes the spiritual body to be understood, he shows when he adds, quote, but the last Adam was made a quickening spirit, end quote, plainly referring to Christ, who who has so risen from the dead that he cannot die anymore. He then goes on to say, quote, but that was not first which is spiritual, but that which is natural and afterward, that which is spiritual. And here, he much more clearly asserts that he referred to the animal body when he said that the first man was made a living soul, 
and to the spiritual when he said that the last man was made a quickening spirit. The animal body is the first um, being such as the first Adam had, and which would not have died had he not sinned, being such as all, such also as we now have, its nature being changed and vitiated by sin to the extent of bringing us under the necessity of death, and being such as even Christ condescended first of all to assume, not indeed of necessity, but of choice. But afterwards comes the spiritual body, which already is worn by anticipation by Christ as our head, and will be worn by his members in the resurrection of the dead. Don't you just love it when that happens? <laughs> <laughs> I, I flubbed a little bit at the end, but but yeah. I... I, I think it's interesting that we're kind of having the same conversation uh, mm. in, in, in this in this volume, and I, I'm, uh, well, I'm 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 interested to to see the transparency, perhaps, uh, between the layers of discourse uh, that we've been going between, oscillating between, and seeing if maybe that. That perspective or that meta perspective gives greater clarity on the on the whole. Well, um, I I would like to quote something from Michael Grosso on the. He gives a brief history of the transmission model of mind, mm -hmm. um, which I believe has a lot to. It's a quotation from Saint Augustine. I think resonates with the transmission model. I think he was an emanationist, comes right out of Plato. And I think he's grafting on the Platonic stuff onto um, the emerging Christian worldview. So he's in the in-between, talking about the animal and the, the spiritual body, the animal body and the evolution of the animal body into the resurrected spiritual body. Um, anyway, this quote from Michael Grosso, which I think is very provocative. Um, he says, the, the core intuition endures, I believe, because it is experience driven. Whatever the reigning metaphysical dogmas of the day, a significant minority always seem to come out with reports of some form of transcendent experience these individuals will continue to find themselves at odds with established view on fundamental issues. The transmission model has a perennial attraction precisely because people keep having the, the kinds of experiences that demand a model of its open type. Physicalism will continue to fail to account for the full spectrum of human experience. For this reason, it is grossly inadequate and should once and for all be tossed on ash heap of history. He's talking about Physicalism. Um, I'm, I'm open to um, criticism about the this particular um, this particular model. That uh, I think in the in the in the, in the first chapter, there's uh, talking about the filter model and this transmission model, it's sort of synonymous. But the whole idea is that, that the nervous system or the animal body is, is a reducing valve or it keeps out uh, a great deal for very good reasons. Um, but that uh, it's sort of, uh, I think the criticism was about the difference between um, production, production and permission. And he says the nervous system or the brain especially does not produce consciousness. Um, but it gives permission. And I'm a little baffled by that, that criticism. And I think it's a worthy, worthy question to explore. Um, and there, um, I think the, um, the Myers was someone with his, with his particular model, I think is very sophisticated. Uh, he was dealing with paranormal experiences. And I just found this little chart can you guys see that? It's the, 
Yeah, it's back off a little. That's better. Hey, there's this is the this is the subliminal cell. Mm-hmm. And this is the wait, Subliminal. this is the subliminal self up top. I'm confused. Oh, the superliminal self. Super, superliminal, yeah. yeah. That's on the, there's a membrane or a threshold between this self and the subliminal self, which opens up into what he's calling a cosmic self. Um, and within the subliminal self, there's all kinds of automatisms, and he's looking at um, mediumship and multiple personalities and hypnotism and um, phantasms of the dead, automatic writing, automatic speaking, um, but that they uprush and break through the barrier that separates the superliminal from the subliminal. Um, so that's a, that I think is very helpful. So we can contrast and compare um, these different kinds of models and where Myers is coming from, because he was he was very influenced by Darwin and, and the whole idea of evolution. But he made a distinction between there, there are different kinds of evolution. And I think this um, what Saint, Saint Augustine was referring to is the animal body and the spiritual body. Um, I think uh, that there's a, there's that interplay going on, and I think it's. Uh, I do believe that Myers had a very strong uh, platonic um, influence. He was deeply influenced, maybe even uh, neoplatonic. Um, anyway, I'm just throwing that out because I think it is experience driven, um, this, um, this attraction for these transmission models, certainly my own experience. I'll tell you an experience that I actually had. See this? This is the Major Arcana, uh -huh. uh, the High Priestess. Uh -huh. In my early 20s, I, um, it was late at night. I got up in the middle of the night. This is before I'd had any sort of psychic training or any sort of exposure. Uh, and I was uh, playing around with this image. And I was sitting up in bed. And um, I felt like I had been struck by lightning. And I, and I found myself, the sensations, the kinesthetic sensations of floating up, up, up and away. And then I saw this figure in a black cape, I kid you not. And it told me to go back to where I came from. <clears throat> and then I felt, I felt these uh, sensations of falling, this kinesthetic sensation of falling back into my physical, a physical body, which I was quite familiar with and identified as Johnny's body in my bed in Manhattan. And next to me, there's a chest of drawers. The chest of drawers start to rattle and make knocking noises. So I said, okay, this is a very interesting experience that I don't want to repeat. <laughs> I don't want to have this experience again. But it did um, waken me up to a, a whole spectrum of experience that I was not mature enough to handle. And I also knew that I had no models, no adequate models um, for this in the sort of current psychological um, milieu that I was swimming around in. But I think a few years later, the uh, new age kicked in. About a half, maybe five or six years later, we started seeing the, uh, the new age uh, starting to kick in. And um, I think I started to get into psychic stuff and I went to Wise's bookstore and I started to meet other people who were interested in, in the healing arts and um, I started to study it. So, and then I saw, I also studied cognitive psychology and neuro-linguistic programming and, you know, all kinds of um, different kinds of models. And here, you know, 30, 40 years later, I'm still, uh, have had lots of different experiences. Um, and also, I want to I want to find new metaphors that work better. And I'm looking at um, the idea of whirlpool, um, the idea of a membrane um, that vibrates, 
um, there are other metaphors out there. I, I think that it, uh, the one that I find, um, the whirlpool comes out of, um, who's that guy? Castrop, Bernardo Castrop. Mm. I think you know him. We've, we've yeah. talked about him. Yeah. And his metaphor, uh, he says, it's, it's, the mind does not generate, the brain does not generate the mind any more than a whirlpool generates water. Oh. Um, so I think uh, the only way we can get a handle on this stuff is through metaphors. And the metaphors we choose, I think, will inhibit and reveal and also conceal. So hopefully we can take that wherever we want to go. Hope that was useful. Thank you. Did you want to say something, uh, Jeffrey? Well, um, I mean, I, I, I think I'd be, I'm a, a little bit repeating myself from what I said in the written, in the written form, but um, I mean, um, I, I actually find the text a quite strong presentation of the current state of the art in terms of what science says, and I follow it and more or less agree with it right up to the point where he says, uh, this is inadequate without really saying why it's inadequate. He just says, it's, he sort of says it's obvious it's inadequate. And there's, uh, I think that's a questionable statement. And then he says, then he sort of says, well, we're going to throw out the productive approach and we're going to look at the transmissive or filter, filter approach. And he does argue to, to, that there is a scientific basis for doing that. That is to say, it is a logically consistent approach, which I agree with, and that it is used from a, from a scientific kind of perspective to examine that kind of approach or that kind of a model or, and, and explore it within its own context, which I entirely agree with. Um, it's just that, as I say, I find that I'm not personally interested in abandoning or stepping that far away from the productive uh, model. And so I'm happy for somebody else to do it, but I don't want to do it myself. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm not sure that if the conversation continues into the rest of the book that I'm going to be there for that. Mm -hmm. But I'm happy to take part in the opening discussion about these issues because I do think it is important. The other comment that I had about this, it's more a kind of, um, and, and like I say, um, I'm not questioning psychic experiences, although I think there is an issue in terms of how do you validate what is tangible or, or how do you separate out the good from the bad? How do you separate what's real from the not real? If you, if you throw out the scientific method, you're you're stuck with a problem with determining what is good and what is bad. And so, or if you throw out a good chunk of the scientific approach, you're stuck with a problem of how do you distinguish between what is worthwhile and what is not. So there is that issue. But um, but uh, he draws a lot of his argument on James, and um i've read a lot about james by other commentators but i haven't actually i've got radical empiricism on my desk as a as a read a must read and i haven't <laughs> actually read it personally and i really feel that in order to understand these arguments about james and the 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 sort of take that he's taking on james's writing I, I, I think I need to go back and read James in the in the first person in order to understand my own take because James I have a lot of respect for I have a, James underlies the Gibsonian affordance approach which he talks a little bit about um, and there, so this idea of filtering you, we're talking here about filtering in in terms of consciousness but. James's idea of filtering is not just in terms of conference, but also in uh, uh, of consciousness, but also our relationship with the environment. So, his under his the whole idea of affordances, in a sense, is that there is a kind of filtering process going on 
in our interaction with the environment. The difference from the classical information theory of idea of, of interaction. And I see that this idea of um, filtering in the sense of consciousness is kind of in a way related to his ideas about filtering with the environment. And I find that interesting. I want to look into that. Uh, but I don't understand the arguments well enough to be able to judge what's going on here. With that. So um, I'm both interested in parts of the discussion and mm -hmm. but skeptical about the, the, the sort of stepping away from the productive model. Mm -hmm. May I ask uh, Jeffrey a couple of follow-up questions on that? Yeah, yeah. Uh, so I want to, if I understand correctly how your uh, your orientation with respect to the text, uh, you would be more aligned with uh, John Searle's uh, biological naturalism. I'm I'm just trying to sort out like the, the 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 details here. Where, but the idea being that consciousness is real, but that it emerges from as a, a property or quality of uh, the, uh, the the the, the function of the of the biological brain. Yeah. Uh, I, I, you do have this sort of um, fuzzy area of whether or not, so it's kind of a philosophical issue in a way, is if consciousness is, emerges from matter, in a sense, it has to pre-exist in matter, right? It, 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 in a sense, it, there has to be, there has to be a, a kind of a continuity there. And so there's a kind of a prefiguring going on, even in the physical approach. So it's not entirely true that you're saying this new thing that we call consciousness is emerging from this other thing we call matter. Mm. It's really that matter and consciousness are intimately bound and tied up together in a single entity and the and it and it transforms in in the mix in the way it expresses itself mm -hmm. so i don't and and that sound begins to sound a little bit more like the filtering you know that it's not entirely separate from this other approach it sounds a little bit like an implicit uh model or the the sense of consciousness being implicit in matter than but then becoming explicit through an evolutionary or an emergent process right. and that, yeah. that yeah okay I, I uh because th there's a lot of terminology in this in this mm. text it's a it's a i mean one of the things that i appreciated about it it was is that it was such a strongly academically grounded uh text so it's right. really a review of literature uh it's synoptic uh in so far as it presents an intellectual history of the way that these arguments have emerged and for me, not being a, a, you know a, an expert on, in any sense in, in this domain, but being more like a pollinator who who you know jumps between different uh, uh, you know flowers and pick, picking up bits, there, there's a lot that I think we might need to just get a handle on, right? Between uh, the the sense of a perceptual synthesis, the natural language processing. I'm reading from my notes here. Uh, there's classical or symbolic cognitivism. There's a computational theory of mind uh, that's you know blends into the cognitive neuroscience, and then you know where where Kelly there's more to that, but where Kelly goes with this as I as I read it is he he takes you through his own journey of becoming enamored of uh, the computational theory of mind this this notion that we can not just model the brain but the, that those models themselves could be uh, what would be the word like accurate as to how consciousness actually happens or re, re, not even that really. I mean, the, the problem is that they, they erase the question of consciousness and he comes to that realization or the kind of view himself. And that's where he parts ways with Cyril. Uh, and that I think is really the interesting, yeah, but if I were to caricature Searle a little bit, I think Searle is close to sort of 
I mean, to some extent, he says this is what people think, but I'm not quite sure that I agree with that because Searle is more of an embodied cognitive scientist, and the embodied cognition is not by any means the most current understanding of these things. It is really an emergent process right now in terms of there's a change in paradigm that's currently going on. It's still not at all the dominant uh, story about cognition. So, but I disagree with that. Kind of, hmm? I disagree with that. I think that is the dominant mode right now. And the, the people that are driving the consciousness discussion of the Dennett's, Searle has, has his reservations. I, I agree with you there. But your he's statement not that... Embodied cognitive. He's not the, embodied cognitive. He's a representationalist. That, that, that may well be. Um, that's not the point that I'm trying to make. The, the idea is... Um, behind all of this, that consciousness, what you had said for, before about consciousness is in a way kind of presupposed and, and comes out of these biological processes, but that is strictly denied by the Pinkers and the Dennets and the people who, and, and even Searle, who is a biologist. It has to come out of the biology. And so, and so it, no, John, no. It's in the physical processes themselves. There's no consciousness there until it shows up. It is something that emerges there from. There is no presupposition there. But Ed, like life, like let's let's go step back and look at the I agree. emergence mm-hmm. of life from physical process. Mm-hmm. In a sense, those living properties are built into the way matter is made. Otherwise, they couldn't emerge. I, I agree with that. I, I agree with that 100%, but they. But this is the point that, that Kelly makes, and this is the point, if you read Dennett, he says it is not there before. But I don't agree with Dennett. I, I, I don't agree with it either. That's why I agree with you. That's why I agree with you. But I think if you say that's what they're saying, then that's the incorrect statement, because no, they're not saying that. Saying. I'm just saying that, the, I mean, right. there are these different currents of thought within the, the, the current... You know, exactly. Right. And exactly. And that is, that's that's precisely where Kelly, I see, is picking up because and that's the part that he says is untenable to deny that it's there. And he says, now we need to rethink it. He's actually representing in many, many ways exactly what you're saying, except he's going to this. He's abandoning uh, an emergent for approach for a transmission filtering approach. Well, it appears in, in many ways that that's the case, but I don't think he's abandoning anything. Another thing you said was he's going to, to like ignore things of the scientific method. Well, the thing that, and this is what Marco just said. No, I, I ignore the scientific method. I don't well, know. The thing that, that I find so strong about, about uh, Kelly's argument is he said, we have all kinds of data these are, and, and this data has been, and this is a valid point that Jeffrey has, you know, what if it is good and what if it is suspect? And how do we decide what is and what isn't? And he wants to apply an extremely strict methodology to this. And he, he explicitly states that in this introduction in order to sort the good from the bad, if you will, so that we can make a more reason, come to more reasonable conclusions about how things might function in this realm. So he's not stepping away from anything. He's simply saying, you come to a point, and the pure physicalist approach is, it simply a, a consciousness simply appears. It's not there before. We suspect it is, but they say it's not. And he said that's untenable. You, you have to think beyond that, because if you think that, then there are certain things you must, by definition, ignore. And those no. are precisely the things that, that the mainstream is ignoring. Things like psychic effects, genius, mystical experiences, all, all of this weird, odd stuff that doesn't get included. But it doesn't get included because it's hard to make the difference of what what's worthwhile and what isn't and that's well, part of it no it gets excluded because it can't be then it well, says explicitly it well, isn't because it can't be he says well, that isn't the only one in the game 
No, he isn't, but he is one of the loudest voices in the game. Well, um, and we have to deal with the loudest voices as well. And I think that's what Kelly is doing here at the beginning. He's saying, this is what people are, this is what most people think. Um, if you look at, if you look at the, um, should uh, we back who, who's I'm getting lost. Can we backtrack a little bit? I just oh, have a few questions. Hmm? I don't want this to be the focus of the whole discussion. Necessarily, yeah. I think, um, Dennett and Dawkins and, um, and Sam Harris, to some extent, the new atheists, strong, you know, and I think Searles is sort of, sort of in between. And and I'm sort of sympathetic. Jeffrey, you didn't quite say this, but I don't know that the paranormal should be studied um, scientifically in a, in a laboratory with guys in, you know, white lab coats, you know, doing statistical analysis. I think that um, that's sort of a that's a very artificial way of trying to capture this uh, these very ephemeral kinds of experiences that I don't think are that rare, actually. Um, but I just wanted to backtrack a little bit because I think you said something. Both of you have said some very interesting things about um, the scientific method. Jeffrey, I'm just curious about which scientific method are we talking about? I mean, there's physics, there's chemistry, there's biology, there's geology, there's psychology. I mean, there's so many different methods that are employed in these different disciplines. Um, and I also have another question. Um, what is matter that consciousness can be reduced to it? Uh, I just have heard so many whatever matter is, seems to be getting more and more ephemeral each day. Uh, so it seems to be very elusive. Uh, and the more granular it becomes, uh, the more I think uh, these permeable boundaries, uh, what's inside a boundary and what's outside of a boundary starts to blur. So it seems like a, a, our organisms are sort of a, a, a patchwork of, uh, it's like a collage or a, or a fuzzy kind of, um, it's very fuzzy, these boundaries. So, and then uh, just to go back a little bit to the metaphor that um, our friend Searles uses, he says, thought is to the brain as digestion is to the stomach. That's about as uh, physicalist as you can get. I think it's a very distorted analogy because, you know, he's, he's, He's once again reducing everything to this to the biological, and also another big question. I don't know what the you know is consciousness the same thing as mind. I think we often use it interchangeably, but I I wonder if that's a totally wise thing to do. But I'll, one more quote from Kelly, and I think I'll just rest my piece because I'm really curious about any responses you guys have. Um, this quote from Kelly sounds a little bit Augustinian in a way. He says, the human being is a material being seamlessly embedded in the physical world and is also rooted in a hidden wider environment that underlies and interpenetrates the world of ordinary experience, a meta ethereal realm lying beyond the material. So I think that I'm reminded of some sort of resonance between what Kelly just said and what Augustine was comparing with, with the animal body and the spiritual body, that there is definitely an animal material body that uh, humans are embedded in. And also there is a hidden wider environment that we are rooted in. I, I largely agree with everything you say. So <laughs> Thanks. Uh, I, I feel like I'm, I, I feel like I'm going out on a limb and sawing, sawing it off. <laughs> I mean, one of the questions I have about this whole discussion is, is there's this attempt to, to link, so this relationship between mind and brain, right? But if we're going to talk about religious experience, aren't we talking about something that isn't necessarily mind? I mean, these sort of different realities or different experiences may seem to have something more to do with this sort of 
raised or alternative states, whatever you call them. But maybe we're talking more about soul than we are about mind. And maybe they are different. You know, there's, there's no, there's nothing written. I mean, does a soul exist separate from the mind? I mean, it's a good question, and there's no clear answer about that. Science has almost nothing to say about it. But I don't think, I think we're, I think the argument about mind and brain may be missing the point to some extent. I Uh, think so. I'm interested in the difference between first person and third person. And how do we oscillate between first person, third person, and second person? And I think um, I think it was Bernardo Castro who said that the brain is a second person view of a first person experience. So I, I see a guy lifting weights in a gym. I can look at his brain and see certain activity in his brain. But that's a perspective, a different perspective than the physical first person experience of lifting weights in the gym. And I think when it becomes third person is when, an, when you have uh, more than one person making an observation, you have third person. But I think where uh, the third person though is a special case of first person and second person. And I think these are the kinds of, uh, this is the kind of mess that happens when we fail to appreciate these different perspectives on, you know, they're different um, camera angles if you want. There's an inside, there's an outside, there's in, be- there's a, the in between. And um, anyway, I think that's where the, the different kinds of metaphors that, w- that could start emerging as we start to study uh, complex observing systems. Because we are observers and we are observing and uh, it's, as I understand the little bit of quantum mechanics and that I've gotten into, that it's a uh, very indeterminate. Uh, and um, what we're calling non-dualism is also indeterminate. The subject object split becomes uh, very fluid and dynamic and very hard to track, especially if you're using um, very first level sort of cybernetic systems. You know, I'm the observer, you are the observed. Um, I think that kind of uh, science is sort of, um, I think we're still dominated by it. I think it's sort of a mental deficient kind of science. I did want but I think we're, it's starting to break up. I did want to come back to what you were saying about method. So, because um, I work a lot in the, I mean, I, I started off my career in quantitative science started off in physics but these days i do so more social human science than i do physical science and most of the methods we i use are qualitative right case studies their uh their interviews with people their you know their attempts to elicit information out of the lived experience for instance so we're talking about something and these are perfectly rigorous methodologies scientific Uh They're just not statistical or quantitative in the traditional sense. So uh, we don't have to think of the scientific method as being necessarily statistical or quantitative. It can be very, you know, very touchy-feely, if you like, in a a way. Um, But one of the characteristics, and and even the repetitivity, so in the physical and the statistical sciences, you're interested in, in in making observations that you can repeat and it's the repetitivity that gives you the sense of assurance and of course that's a problem in areas like we're looking at here where you're dealing with ephemeral experiences that don't repeat uh, often and yet in in the in the qualitative sciences of course for human experiences you're in the same kind of situation and so there are very there's a lot of work that's been done on developing methodologies that allow you to elicit useful information. In a sense, though, you're always looking for 
a generality, even with the qualitative approaches. You're looking to extract something that is a general property of human beings, even if you're looking at specific experiences. And it's this general quality that is the characteristic of science. Uh, so when you talk about the science, when I talk about the scientific me me uh, method, typically you're talking about re repetition, but in the context of these ephemeral phenomena, you're talking about generate ge the, the ability to gener generalize okay and then to verify the generalization through another context, which is your repetitivity. So it's a very particular kind of repetitivity. So that's when we talk about the scientific method, that's what we're talking about. Personally, I have some interest in another approach, which is more the singular, and I've talked a little bit about that, but that's, that's a different and non-scientific, not, not currently validated scientific technique. Jeffrey, are, are you um, uh, reluctant to uh, embrace a particular model, like a filter model or a transmission model? Is that is that the uh, the kind of germ of the uh, skepticism that you feel towards Kelly? That he seems to be moving in a direction that maybe doesn't seem as promising to you, like in in you know leaving um, an emergentist model or other you know disciplines or approaches that are active and are generating you know, new perspectives. Do you, f do you feel like there's a weakness in going that direction? There's a, some uh, better way to account for the divergence of phenomena that are not being uh, included in the more you know, cognitive uh, reductionistic kinds of appro approaches? So the problem I have with the what, and maybe it's my reading of Kelly as opposed to your reading of Kelly. <laughs> Uh, or somebody else's reading of Kelly, is I see a kind of Cartesianism creeping back into the argument. So this idea, a little bit, your animal versus the spiritual, although if those are different, your animal body versus the, although those are maybe different things as opposed to this attempt to put them into the same place, which is what the, Cartesian duality is doing. Mm. Um, but so this, and the problem with this Cartesian duality thing is it's extremely insidious. Is it, it's built into the way we think about the world because we were all raised within an education system that teaches us this dualistic thinking of the world. And it's very, very hard to not fall into the trap of thinking that way. And I think, and my, my, my work in the last uh, 10, 15 years, has, uh, it, it seems like a lot of the, uh, you know, I have a whole list of the different polarities that are related to, dual, to, to Cartesian dualism. Um, you know, mind-body split is one thing, but, uh, you know, spiritual versus physical, you know, there's a whole... Um, uh, anyway, there's a whole slew of different polarities that have a resonance with this thing. But, but in this I'm text... Go into a kind of dualistic approach that you've lost the stuff that we've, we've struggled ha -ha so hard to get to, to mm -hmm. untangle the dualisms that are in... Uh, that are in can, we, can we differentiate without separating? I think that's... Because there are differences, but those differences don't necessarily separate. Um, there's mind, cognition, um, maps, language, and then there's the somatic experience, my heart pounding, my digestion, my gut, the butterflies in my stomach, all the metaphors I might come up with um, to describe certain somatic experiences. And then there's the interplay of the, the cognitive and what I would call the somatic, which I think is very similar to what Myers is describing and certainly what Aurobindo is describing. But all of that is happening within a certain environment. And I think the trouble is when we, when we talk about consciousness as emerging from a brain, we never see a brain without a body. We never see a body without an environment. 
Well, exactly. In that, so we, how can we say the brain causes consciousness or mind? There must be some dynamic interplay. Differences, yes, but separation, I would say, no. There's differences. But I don't think we can collapse all those differences into a sameness. That, I think that's the trick, because there are subtle there is an animal body. There's a spiritual body. There's a, there's subtle experiences, and they come through the physical. And I think that's where we get where we tap into the, those imag the imaginary and those imaginal experiences. Sometimes dreams and visions, or out of body, or whatever you want to call them. But I think there, there's a, a wonderful quote: "The imaginal. This is not just imagination or hallucination. This is where I think the physicalists." Uh, constantly uh, distort these kinds of psychic experiences um, but these anomalies they don't fit the paradigm rather than changing the paradigm to accommodate these experiences they tend to lock people up that's what the diagnostic statistical manual says anyone who believes much less has uh, uh, has a belief in the sick in a, a sixth sense has a, a schizotypal uh, disorder that needs to be treated. So I think, you know, with these kind of prohibitions, uh, it, it's no wonder that so many people have these experiences, keep them quiet, or they internalize and they generate a great deal of uh, disturbances. But I think the, uh, the difference between the imaginary and the fantasy prone and the imaginal is, is a, this quote, and it's by Jeffrey Kripal, he says, the imaginal is in touch with and translating a higher dimension of reality. The imaginal is the imagination on steroids. The imaginary is Clark Kent, the normal. The imaginal is Superman. I think that's very suggestive of, uh, our, of the direction that humanity could go in if we start to uh, loosen up these hard neuromuscular locks, which inhibit our access to, I think what Myers is calling the, the subliminal self or the somatic self. Um, and I think a greater access to it would not lead into a, a collapse into the, a flood of the irrational. Some people might have trouble. But I think ultimately we can integrate this, these capacities and, um, and start to flourish rather than being, you know, marginalizing these people as certain oddities and ignoring them and brushing these anomalous events under the rug. I just don't think that's what that's... Sorry. Sorry. If somebody else wants to jump in, please do. Otherwise, I'll just keep going and <laughs> say... Mode, but well, we haven't heard from Ed in a while. Yeah, and and yeah. Ed proposed proposed this text, uh, presumably for a reason. <laughs> Ed, you look frozen. You look like a a head. Um, yeah, you're starting to freak us out. <laughs> <laughs> That's better. Hey, Ed? Yes? you hear us? I, I can hear you. You were breaking up, and, and oh, okay. I, I, I think my internet connection's... I, I get a message every once in a while that says it's unstable. Uh, we, um, uh, we were just curious about... You were interested yeah. in this text, and so was I. And mm -hmm. uh, do you have a response to any of the stuff we're talking about? Something's coming up for you? Um, no, actually, I wanted to uh, go back to what uh, Marco had said right at the very beginning about Augustine. Um, he talks about the animal and the spiritual, but he refers to them as bodies. And when we hear that, we, we automatically, I think, at least I do. And I don't think that's what he's talking about, because what I found interesting in the further elaboration of what he was saying, um, he talked about Adam, the animal body, as a living soul, and he talked about Jesus in the spiritual body as a living spirit. 
And soul and spirit have nothing to do with bodies in any sense that we generally think of bodies. But there is a certain amount of manifestation that can occur in a particular, I'll call it a realm for lack of a better word. Um, this comes up as an aside, I don't know who may or may not know what's going on, but um, Jonathan Cobb's last two pieces deal with specifically with this, exactly what we're talking about now as something, let's say, substantial enough to be referred to as a body, even though it's not tangible in, in and of itself. That's why, uh, like in the magic tradition, the astral realm, uh, Steiner talks about that a lot. These are, these are very real things. Um, they are talked about in the same way that we talk about our physical environments, but they're not physical in the sense that, you know, I have a desk here and I can pound on it and you can hear me knocking and things like that. So we, we have a, a, a partial problem of trying to express what it is that we're talking about and describe it in terms that are, uh, that are reasonable, but we also have um, a body of evidence that that does not get the attention that I think Kelly thinks it deserves. And in order to do that, he's looked for something in the traditional literature that would give him a basis for doing that. And he found that in James and, and in Myers. And that's his starting point. That's what he wants to start with. Um, I'm the only one that's read the whole book, so I can tell you that's not where he ends. But where he ends up, you have to either... Look at the last, look at chapter nine and read it, or you have to follow the argumentation through in order to get there. Um, but what I find um, interesting about his approach is that he's, he's obvious, to me at any rate, he's obviously trying to overcome that split that Johnny referred to of separate and what I thought hear Jeffrey talking about. There are these polarities that we see them. There, there are polarities. There's these there's like continua and somewhere in there it just keeps resonating back and forth and what what we've done in Gapesarian terms and that's the mental rational is to split them we've actually taken the axe and hewed them in two and it's extremely hard to put them back together again those of us who have had other experiences or have gone through a different way of, of coming to the points that we are realize that that's an artificial separation it's not a real separation. It doesn't really happen. Um, I've never been, I've never really believed, though you can make a real strong case for it, that uh, Descartes himself saw them as so separate that they were not reunitable. He describes them, and he, he goes through a substance kind of uh, argumentation. I understand all that. But this is where I find that most of the people that have come after, or most of the, the all of that that we've gained um, in the last couple of hundred years um, has been absolutized in a way that was not intended to begin with. You know, we've kind of departed from what the actual intent of all of that was. You know, Descartes himself still believed in God. And those today who are his true followers, so to speak, don't. Well, okay. But so what does that mean for Descartes? It just means we interpret him in a particular way. And it, a lot of it is based on how we interpret things. And we can all read the same words and come up with different ideas of what was being said there. That, that's the, the part that I, I find interesting about the discussions that we have, because we are looking at the same words. And I don't see, I don't see that, that absolute split from the beginning. And so it's a lot easier for me to say, okay, I can see where the limits of this approach have gotten us. And I'm, and I, I'm, I'm a very, very big fan of science for precisely the reason that Jeffrey said. To me, it's not about, excuse me? I got a... There was an audio glitch. You can keep going. Okay, that's okay. Um, to me, the scientific method, for example, is not about statistics. That's one technique that can be used for certain kinds of things. But it's about consistency and rigor and making clear your assumptions and making, um, uh, trying to eliminate the extraneous, uh, making, making um, plain in, in, in lots of ways why and why not you are doing whatever it is that you're doing. It has as much more to do with principles than it has to do with actual details. 
to come out of it. And, and what, what bothers me, and that, that's the whole new age thing, is you grab onto something because a particular word might be used and you run with it. Well, that's nice, except that it's not very scientific and it's not very helpful in the end. And the, and the real help comes from, from rigor. And to me, that's the, 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 the top principle of them all. You have to be rigorous in what you're doing. And you have to be consistent and coherent with those things that you say, this is what I'm going to do. That, that's the point that I brought up when we were reading Young. You know, you can agree with him or disagree with him, but at least he lays out, this is what I'm doing and this is why I'm doing it. So you can also engage that. It's not just I'm presented with some data, figure it out for yourself or do your own interpretation or see how you, uh, how you statistically want to deal with something. So and I think that, that these scientific things these, these, uh, this approach that we consider scientific is, is valuable and, and that we should pursue it. And that, that's what I admire Bob Kelly is he says, and I want to do precisely that. I want to look at all the data. I don't want any data excluded. And we'll look at the data and then we'll decide, is it good data, bad data? And if, it's, if we decide it's good data, what does it mean for us? And, so that sounds fair, Ed. <clears throat> I, yeah. I, I want to pick up on what I think I heard in Jeff some of Jeffrey's original statements mm-hmm. about the transmission model and the filter model and whether or not that's the direction that, that Kelly is going in uh, or if that is really just a part of a, of a larger view that really has to be taken into account. Because I think what I'm, what I'm, I'm hearing in Jeffrey's uh, concern there is that if you have a transmission model, then you still have this dualism between you, know, you have a signal a transmitter, the brain, or whatever it is, and then the meaning that you know is interpreted uh, on the basis of that transmission. But you s- still have these atomistic kind of entities that are interacting with one another, rather than that fluid, bigger flow, a bigger you know context that is flowing into it all. And is there a name for that bigger context? I don't. I don't know. I mean, that it lends itself to religious. Uh, interpretations, frameworks, uh, grand narratives, etc. And I mean, maybe uh, what I sense, what I feel is a, a kind of hesitance to go into uh, another ism, another grand narrative. Like, is, does this end up in panpsychism or in some other kind of uh, ultimate framework that is, you know, not going to be as um, faithful to the nuances that emerge through, you know, all the all the the um, I mean through doing the research itself or having the experience itself? Well, I, I think that's very, um, when you talk about the meaning that is interpreted, um, it seems to me, I think evolution is driven by our interpretations of events. And I think uh, the name, that larger context that you're talking about, I think um, Myers called it the subliminal cell. And he said that the subliminal self speaks to the ego through signs. I think this is very interesting um, because I, cause, cause reading and writing, I'm borrowing from Kripal here, reading and writing is a psychic transmission. We can read texts that were created by people who've been dead for many, you know, centuries. Um, And we can um, resonate with their experience if it's a particularly good, good writing. Um, So I think we're constantly interpreting and reinterpreting and revising. And I think this subliminal self is, uh, presents to us these anomalies um, these paranormal events as a kind of non-dualistic signal. So I'm quoting here, a paranormal event is one in which a material event corresponds more or less precisely to a subjective event or a mental state, collapsing the assumed subject-object dualism of our ordinary cognitive and sensory experience and suggests some super reality that is neither mental nor material, but is somehow both. And I think that's that the continuum of the spectrum, that it's not either or, it's both and. And I think that's where I think um, uh, our future is. 
is uh, appreciating that it's 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 both material. It is neither mental nor material, but it is somehow both. And we have stories. I believe you mentioned earlier what religion is. And religion is stories. Mm. It seems to me a large uh, part of what it is to be a human is to have to remember certain stories that you've told about yourself. And I, I believe that's uh, extremely crucial that um, that narrative element be appreciated. Uh, and to some extent cultivated. I think that's what we're doing in our writing group, in our underground writing group. It's taking these subtle experiences and putting them into words and then bringing them into a space, a shared a communal space, uh, I believe does have a transmissive quality. Something is transmitted. The group starts to transmit to itself, about itself. If that, that, that self-reflexive capacity starts to uh, kick in. So I'm just putting that out there. Um, I think all of our models that we've inherited from pre-modern, uh, as magnificent as they are, we do need to update them. And I, I think to some extent, what we've uh, tried to, um, you know, these, these quantum mechanics, uh, I think it's starting to, um, you know, I, I, I was influenced by Wilbur and he said, physics is not, is not that important really to, uh, to these kinds of uh, to these kinds of experiences, to transformation. And that we shouldn't um, get too caught up in the reductivism of physics. Um, but now I'm starting to think differently because I think we're starting to, these, these kinds of experiences are starting to scale up because we talk about telepathy and, uh, you know, picking up on information between brains separated by great distances um, and by location and, and precognition. They all seem to speak to some to something that's um, what what would I, what would you call this something that is um, trans temporal, and yet there's still the historical ego that has to chop wood and carry water and make sense from day to day, and, and I think this uh, oscillating back and forth between these different dimensions, um, in a, in a disciplined way is, uh, I think, crucial. Um, so that we're driven by, print. we still have principles um, rather than just flying by the seat of our pants. Because mm -hmm. we, we have a lot of pressures, uh, evolutionary pressures on us. Um, and I think that's why I'm here showing up, trying to uh, put into words this stuff. It's trying to com compare and contrast all these different models. Because it gives me a headache. I, mm -hmm. I lost sleep last night trying to work with this stuff. Um, but I said, no, you know, I may not benefit from this personally, but I think if there's a, a future and, you know, others are going to benefit from that, and I'm, I'm going to show up and maybe we'll learn something. I think that's uh, worth putting up with, you know, the, the maybe disappointment. Like, you know, maybe we'll, I'll just be more confused than ever after this conversation. <laughs> <laughs> but it's not this is not this is not easy to figure it out or it would have been figured out a long time ago <laughs> thank you <laughs> I, I um i appreciate ed's comments about the uh and the uh what kelly is trying to do i think i'd probably go back and read kelly with a slightly different pair of of glasses mm -hmm. <laughs> see if I can't tease out a bit more than I did from the second part mm -hmm. of the chapter. Um, I did want to follow up on the quantum stuff. I'm sure there's a lot of interest in the mm -hmm. quantum links to this kind of question. I mean, I, I'm both skeptical and interested myself by the quantum. Um, one of the, one of the, um, theories about brain, which isn't discussed here, though I think uh, Kelly mentions Penrose's name a couple of times, but so Penrose has this very controversial theory about uh, consciousness that, uh, uh, that there's a separate structure in the brain, not neuro neurological, but what he called, what they call tubules, which 
are known to exist and that the tubules permit, they're, they're sufficiently small that the kinds of physical phenomena that are going on in tubules are essentially quantic. And Penrose claims that uh, there's a quantum computer essentially inside the brain through these tubules that is working off of um, quantum superposition in order to obtain things. And that consciousness is somehow in some ill-defined way related to this secondary structure. It's a very controversial uh, uh, theory, but I always like these kinds of push, these, these theories that push us in ways that the regular scientists, the regular community doesn't really want to go, that pushes us off the edge a little bit, even though they're questionable in other ways, you know? So I always like these kinds of, uh, and Penrose is a very interesting guy this way. He's, he doesn't like to stay within the the boundaries of what everybody else is doing. Um, so there but is. Wouldn't you need a quantum computer to uh, simulate like that that kind of a quantum you know based brain? I mean, wouldn't that just go down the same direction that Kelly is criticizing? It is. It is a bit down the same. So it so it's both interesting and yet somehow doesn't really answer the question, right? So. Uh, but that's true of many of these kinds of approaches. That uh, is, is part of the problem I have with trying to find a scientific model for, you know, phenomena that may not be easy, 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 easily um, treated in that way, right? So, um, I mean, I don't have the answers. I just have the questions. <laughs> It's a lot better to have questions than the answers. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, we researchers, so research in English is, is research, but in French it means you're looking. Recherche yeah. is yeah. a look. Yeah. We have this joke that, um, you know, we never find, because if you find you're out of a job, you just, you yeah. have to keep looking, right? Look so, yeah. That's mm -hmm. what a chercheur is. It's a looker. Mm -hmm. <laughs> He he does also look at the work of Henry Stapp. Is that his name? Stapp. Stapp. Yeah. And um, and this is way over my head, but I know um, he did write something in this the follow up to Irreducible mm -hmm. Mind was this book, and oh. Stapp has an essay in here, which I find really baffling. But it's sort of like something about um, collapsing the wave. <laughs> <laughs> and he, he says that the mind or consciousness. Or there has to be some something like a mind which can ask a question and that nature answers that question by collapsing the wave. So he's talking about out of all of these possibilities, nature will collapse depending on the question. So, so he is... He is sort of implying that there is a uh, that there's the the mind has a or consciousness has a particular function, but still it's it's very slippery. Um, among all these possibilities, what gets actualized has a lot to do with someone asking a question. Then it becomes either it could becomes it's not this or that it's this, it's been collapsed. The cat is alive or it's dead, or it's dead. Now the cat is dead, definitely, or the cat is definitely alive. That's a big one for me um, to, to, to digest and absorb. But I think it's um, very relevant, I think, to our discussion if we're looking at physics and psychology and biology and sociology, a new qualitative science. Because basically our lives are qualia, nothing but qualia, like Bernardo Castro says. It's all qualities. Remove the qualities and what do you have? So um, we have abstractions. We abstract from, the, from all this qualia and um, we get trapped in our, in our abstractions, unfortunately. So I think it's that relationship between abstractions and qualia 
concrete and imaginal. All of that's um, in, in very, it's very dynamic. Uh, one of the problems we have, John, I think, is that in order to understand anything, we need a context that we can place it in so that we can kind of sort out the relationships between the elements that we find. And one of the problems that we have in the, in the current state of things where a lot of this quantumness is coming in is that most of us have no clue what they're talking. They, they use all the words and you can read the words and you can, you know, you're you're. In that case, I'm always like what I think AI is. You know, I can look up all of the definitions of all of the words and I still have no clue as to what's being said. Because it's not, the meaning isn't in the, in the lexical, the combination of lexical definitions. It's in something else. And, and it's interesting, you know, Stapp's in the Beyond Physicalism book. But we, we had, Stapp came up in a, a recent discussion we had when we saw the video from Moorhoff. Right. Where Moorhoff exactly. went to great extents to tell Stapp he had no idea what he was talking about in 18 very specific points. And then, and, and Stapp, who has a sense of humor, Moorhoff is German. He doesn't have a sense of humor. I can tell you that is culturally true. That's no stereotype. Um, of the shortest books that were ever written, the thousand years of German humor is the shortest of them. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Castrop does have one of his books, a chapter, a chapter on German humor, and it's a blank page. <laughs> so, <laughs> but because Morov has to show where, where he's wrong or not right, let's put it that way, where he has to show where he's not right, whereas Stapp is saying, we need to think about this in another way. This is what I, I do like about Penrose and people that are willing to push the envelope, they do get you thinking about things in other ways. But I also like to, kn to know that when they're doing this, that, that they're very grounded in what they're saying. So one of the things that, you know, we always have trouble with language. I, and so I have, to, I have to remind people from time to time, German, for example, doesn't have a word for mind. It, it doesn't exist. That whole I thing about is it consciousness or is it mind would never occur to a German because it's just a distinction that, that doesn't come up. Um, Jeffrey pointed out uh, recherche in, in, in French is you look, but you never find. The German word is forschung, and the word forsch means to be brash. So it just means dashing in where angels fear to tread. You never know what's going to come of that. <laughs> so, so it's just, you know, we have, we have these different conceptions about how we go about that. What, what fascinates me and what interests me is, well, how do, we, how do we unify this across cultures and languages and things? So we, we do have to come to agreement, at least amongst ourselves, about what we mean by certain things when we say them. And, and for me, consciousness and Bewusstsein in German has a bigger overlap and is easier to handle than trying to get mind involved in it because the Germans split that into Vernunft and Verstand, which is kind of understanding and reasonableness, if you will. And so, and thinking becomes something else and it gets very technical and very complicated very quickly. So to me, and this is the thing that I find interesting, Morhof does that. We're going to, I'm sure we're going to find this when we get to Aurobindo. This was definitely the case with Young that we had as well. They simply said, well, we'll postulate there's such a thing that is, con that is consciousness. And we're not saying that it's essentially different from matter. It's just that it's first and matter comes afterwards. If there is a relationship, then consciousness is primary, matter is secondary. And from the materialist, he says, no, matter is primary and consciousness is secondary. For me, that's the the easiest way to simply deal with the, the fundamental distinction. And it is, in, in, I think in a lot of regards, a way of simply looking at things. And, and when you look at them one way, you run into certain barriers, obstacles that are hard to overcome. And when you look at it from the other way, you will run into other barriers in other places, as it turns out. Because there's also things that are hard to do. So, to me, it says in the end, well, they are intimately related in some way, 
and we're not real clear. We, and when I say that, we, we human beings are the only ones that are trying to figure it out, aren't really clear on, on what that is yet. And if we could keep that in mind, we would probably have more fr- fruitful um, discussions with people that are, so to speak, on the other side of the fence. Because we're simply trying to understand, well, how is this interaction possible and what is it that comes of it? Well, um, in that article, um, I think we read, or that interview with Meyerhoff was his name? Morhoff. Morhoff. And Morhoff. Uh, there was a, res- a response Stamp, Henry Stapp had to yeah. some yeah. objections about Niels Bohr and the Copenhagen interpretation. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. Um, he did. Uh, he he wrote some very interesting questions, and I have to go back and look at Stapp, Henry Stapp, to sort of figure out how he was responding. But I did like the metaphor of the theater. He mm-hmm. used a there's a backstage where mm-hmm. involution and evolution happens. And there's an onstage drama, and I'm curious about is there a relationship to the drama on stage? and the drama backstage. Uh, and I believe we we have this experience every night when we go to sleep. We go into the backstage area, and there are all kinds of uh, experiences that you can have if you train your mind to work, to work with what's coming up in those uh, those backstage areas. And I believe there is an influence that we have um, when we return to this stage of fools <laughs> and this exterior, this uh, this drama on stage, we're not fools in the other one, John. <laughs> we, we, we certainly can be, but I think there's um, uh, this is also uh, in in dream states and lucid uh-huh. dream, out of body experiences, trance states, meditation, uh, fantasy. Uh, a reverie, um, you know, a walk along the beach, you know, all these, you know, there's enormous overlaps, I believe, between these different uh, levels of consciousness. And I think that the idea of uh, that relationship, that influence between what happens on uh, the drama on stage and what's happening backstage, extremely compelling. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I do believe that we take on roles uh, in our in our waking lives, uh, and we continue to rehearse those roles uh, when we take a little nap, or our, our power nap, or our, if we cultivate hypnotic experiences, or we write stories. And I think there's a a whole lot of uh, those liminal zones, um, that those imaginal realms are, ex- are very powerful. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, I think that the good and evil thing, uh, just, a, just a brief anecdote, I had a, just maybe to clarify this, I had a very, uh, I had some terrifying experiences, but one of the most difficult ones for me to deal with, and I, 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 I considered it an uh, intrusion, that I was, there was a demonic uh, intrusion, because every time I went to sleep, I was, I was visited, not every time, but visited very frequently by a, a, a field of force. Um, and it was very electric and very powerful. And it scared the hell out of me. It was very, very um, sexual. And um, I felt like I was, I felt this, you know. And I used this monk's prayer. Now, by the power of the Christ of God within me, whom I worship with all my heart and all my soul and all my strength, I encompass myself within the divine circle of his protection over which no mortal error dare to pass. Do you bow down to the Christ of God within me? And this energy said, that doesn't work if you don't believe in it. (laughs) (laughs) Then I realized he's right. We're all laughing at you, John. He's right. I don't believe in it anymore. I didn't one time. (laughs) I don't believe in it anymore. I've seen through this need to protect my identity, my ego, my historical ego from this, Mm -hmm. whatever this is. And it might be heaven and it might be hell, but I'm going to let go Mm -hmm. of of that boundary. And as I did, it 
it entered, I'd say it would enter, it entered me, whatever that me was, or whatever kind of body I was in, it entered and it was ecstatic. Aww. This was something that I had known and had forgotten. And it was like a reunion with uh, perfect love. And then it, it, it vanished and it was, and it had a lot of gold. It was a lot of light, Aww. but it was the best no physical sex has ever uh-huh. come anywhere close to this. <laughs> uh-huh. it was, it, and then when I came back into the physical body, uh, I wanted more of it. But it didn't come back for uh-huh. years. Uh-huh. And I walked around like a zombie. It was a tremendous sense of loss. Uh-huh. And because it couldn't get better than that. <laughs> uh-huh. But I had many other experiences that communicated to me this is, you know, thank you very much. And now you have to go back and make a living arrangement. Mm-hmm. We may be turds in hell, but that's our job. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so I'm just sharing that with you guys because the, the religious mind um, that we've inherited, the pre-modern mind, really divided up. It was God and it was Satan. It was good and it was evil. Mm-hmm. I think now, um, hopefully, as we mature, we start to realize we can't divide up um, reality in that in, in this in this way. Um, but Augustine was talking about experience. <clears throat> that mm-hmm. that's what I think. Like e- even though the legacy of this thought is divisive, even though it's hor- horrific in many ways, mm-hmm. he was still talking about something real. And mm-hmm. while quote unquote, what do you mean by real? <laughs> I want. I'm talking about the body. Yeah. I mean, just, I mean, what you experience. You're talking about yeah. physical. That's not. There's a difference I'm between. T- I'm talking about what you experience. Okay. Whatever that was. <laughs> call it trans, I would say it was trans trans physical. But, it, I mean, it physical or trans physical. I mean that that's that's a analytical distinction. Mm-hmm. Right. Which are important. And. That's a different that is, distinction, so though, is in Augustine as mm. a as a moral distinction, as a metaphysical distinction. He's he's making those distinctions in his argument, but the distinctions are about something, just like the distinctions that Kelly is talking about are about something. And so, what that thing is is what gets lost in the reductionistic move. You lose a sense of the whole, and you get fixated on the part that you want to use to explain the whole. That's where I think it should open to. That would be the next step is a whole, a holistic or an integral approach. And again, I don't like using those words because integral mm-hmm. is associated with a framework, which itself is, as Basenji was arguing in his uh, piece on Aurobindo, itself is probably, it, it has to be paradoxically inclusive, has to, uh, transcend and include itself in its own sort of opening to what comes next. Well, the, the problem I have with Wilbur is it's more of a system than it is a method. And I think that's where we need, when we need more methods. And that's why I've been doing clean language and symbolic modeling and doing maps of time and maps of intuition, using language in, in a certain way to get certain kinds of information. Mm-hmm. I believe that can have an accelerate collaboration and and, and uh, resonant interiors. We resonate through symbol, through metaphor, through image. These are signs for something that's beyond um, that we can get better and better at reading. But but the, now I'm all confused. <laughs> <laughs> well, let me share a story. My, my, uh, oh, when oh, I was in Augustine, Augustine yeah. in his confessions, was talking, a huge part of the Confessions is about the death of a beloved friend. He was a young man, they were both very young, and his grief for that person created uh, the conditions for his uh, becoming a Christian. And he was moving from a, from a basic, you know, a pagan to a, uh, to a Christian worldview. And he, I think, much, much later wrote about the city of God. But the city of God, I think, comes out of um, the confessions and that very human, animal, um, physical loss of that mm. beloved friend. 
That's very real. Grief is very real. Hmm. Sorry, I didn't mean you. No, no, that's okay. No, I, 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 I totally agree. And my story is just very is superficial, actually, compared to that that uh, kind of depth of grief that of losing somebody. Uh, but but we, need, we need a superficial story, please. Stop well, it's, no, it really is just, it's, I mean, it's just a, mo- a memory that I, that, that I have, a uh, trace uh, memory, a token uh, experience. Mm. And that was uh, t- when I was in college. I used to take the bus in from my apartment sometimes. And it was, uh, you know, just, I think it was, it was the, maybe a campus bus and the campus had its own buses and they were old repurposed school buses. So this probably would have been one of those blue, it was blue, not yellow in, in, in this case. And I was on the bus and we were pulling in to the campus. So we go through a little neighborhood and then there's a wooded area and then there's a road going into the campus. And I looked out the window and I saw a tree and I had a moment, a sort of Satori moment where I realized that I wasn't looking at the tree and that my mind wasn't looking at the tree. My mind was the tree. My mind was happening all around. And it wasn't just the tree. It was happening all around. So I thought, okay, that makes sense, actually. That that this, what is of concern, what's the matter of concern is not what's happening inside my brain, but what's happening all around, the the, the the whole of it. And although that particular experience as a, uh, you know, token or as a data point faded and I went back into Cartesian, you know, dual, dualism, functional, con- functionally Function, con- functional Cartesian dualism, that sense that, that sense my mind is not, my mind is not, I hear myself echoing. I hear myself echoing. Well, I hear you <laughs> echoing. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's your alter. That's your alter. That's your alter. That's your alter remember and unpack Mm -hmm. and i think that that's where kelly is kind of going here uh this is where he ends up is what he says here uh descartes himself james and cyril among others all have this right Uh, i I didn't read the homunculus problem like we're all uh, conscious experience comes to us whole and undivided with the qualitative feels phenomenological content unity and subjective point of view all built in intrinsic features. I and my experience cannot be separated in this way. And so it's really about starting point. If the starting point is non-separateness, if the starting point is that sense that there is not a separate being in here, a homunculus in here that has to be aware of the data here, the phenomenological display, but the homunculus is the, the whole, essentially. And I'm a you know, point in it, what I my ego self is a point in it that I orient around, but is not the whole, uh, then I could look to the whole to find myself much more fully than I could if I'm trying to explain myself in terms of, you know, the going deeper and deeper into the, you know, parts of my, my body, my brain, my, my neurons, the, the quantum, the, uh, you know, aspect of the atoms in my neurons. That was what Gebser was talking about, of the, 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 the the infinite divis- d- divisive action of the deficient mental because it'll divide and divide and divide and ultimately end up in nothing. Uh, but that's not bad because you exhaust something in, in that process. And so that's why I think Kelly is saying, great, you know, continue on with the you know, computational research into the brain because it gives us models for understanding how we behave in real life. However, if we think that by doing so, we'll be able to explain the, to- the whole, the, re- the totality of our real lives and kind of get to the matter of concern, then I think then we're mistaken. So I think he's pro- like, although he's not saying it here, he's bringing it back to where Latour went, which is that we shift from the matters of um, fact to the matters of concern. And the matters of concern embrace the matters of fact, can't deny them, can't pretend that our brain has nothing to do or that the neurons are totally, you know, unimportant to us. I mean, if somebody came and clubbed my head with a big stone, that would have an effect on uh, on my neurons (laughs) and on the consciousness that's experienced through this body mind. Mm -hmm. Um, But 
the matter of concern is something else. And uh, ha articulating that and holding the method in that, I think, is the, is the that's what, what I think he might be wanting to get to. I think he does want to get to. Uh, and I think that's also what brings like, me here doing this reading and you know, kind of going through the rituals I, I go through even to prepare for it. Like I kind of allow, surrender to the meta mind a little bit and let yeah. a book come off the shelf. And that was the mind working, but it wasn't just happening in my brain. It was happening because of our interactions. And that's very, that's very interesting. I did want to come back just quickly to Ed's point about language, because you talked about German not having the word for mm -hmm. mind. Well, French has a word for mind esprit, which is mm -hmm. etymologically related, related to spirit, yeah. but, but it doesn't have a word for consciousness. Consciousness. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> oh, <laughs> your oh. conscience. Is yeah, your it's a con yeah. For consciousness. So it's um, your conscience. Mm -hmm. is your moral. So yes. the French understanding of consciousness is a moral understanding. In the moral understanding. The yeah. language is built. You know, yeah. So yeah. That, you know these, we tend to have this idea that these words mean... We have this idea, I think, that these words... And the, these words refer to concepts that exist outside of time. Mm -hmm. And that we have these different language pointers to them. Yeah. But you can also argue it the other way, that the words themselves are the concepts. And we have these different concepts of these things. And there may be no reality, you know, in a, in a sense, no, no independent reality, or the independent reality can't be got that that way, you know, so... Well, I, I think that the, uh, the direction of vir understanding consciousness in its virtuality is very interesting uh, for this reason, because <laughs> um, I might not be ready to go all over here <laughs> just, mm -hmm. just yet, but the, pro the productive notion of, of, of the brain or the of mind as a sense producing the, 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 the display, the theater. Uh, and the sense in which all experience is al already virtual. And it's not virtual necessarily through a technological, you know, mechanism, but insofar as it's being generated and insofar as that generation is entangled with our symbols and with the semantics of our symbols and has a certain syntax to it that is significant. We could look at the syntax and understand it, but I, I is there a sense, I, I guess, a question I would want to ask, research question. Is there a sense in which virtuality begins with language? This sort of create, creation of a virtual world, doesn't ha it's not something that's going to happen with Oculus Rift. It's already a process that we're undergoing and is playing out and will expand into the technological virtuality of you know, a VR experience and so forth, but that's already an extension of uh, a virtuality that, that is inherent to consciousness. Just in a, that's just a question that may not be a well-formed question, may not be a very disciplined question, but without getting into the Warfian hypothesis, which is that the whole world is created from language, we don't. Yeah, I, and to me that would be a pot potentially a reductive turn because there mm -hmm. you, you get. You know, you have to deal with natural language processing, but you don't necessarily get to the perceptual synthesis aspect of it and what the relationship between all of the different systems, the dynamic, you know, s systems and uh, of the body with the environment uh, in the, their coupled kind of co-emergence actually produce. Can't just come from linguistic symbols, I think. Mm -hmm. Can I uh, interject since none of you guys have enough to read as it is? <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> but but because of something Johnny had mentioned a long time ago, I picked something up by uh, Donald Merlin Donald. Okay, the, uh, oh yeah, Origins of the Modern Mind. Awesome. And, yeah, and I and I disagree with most of what I'm reading in there, which is why I'm enjoying it at the time at the moment. But he makes after after fighting with them for the first. Seven chapters, <laughs> literally. Um, that's why I can appreciate your 
your curmudgeonry this time, Jeffrey. You know, I read chapter one. No, I'm not buying it. I, by the way, I read chapter one, and I, I thought for about a month on whether I was even going to read the rest of the book. Yeah. And I decided, <laughs> okay, I'll go. I'm going to give it a shot. You know, Johnny brought it up, and I spent all this money to get this big thing. So I'm going to take a look at it, and I have a, a very different attitude towards it. And, and finally, uh, Donald gets around to this, too, because he explores exactly that point. Like, where does language come from, and what role does it play with us? And, and for that reason alone, it's probably worth reading. If you don't agree with how it is that he comes to the conclusions he does, I, I think that's actually secondary. But it is very interesting to see how he tries to explain, well, how do we even have language to begin with? Which is, you know, a very fundamental kind of question. And it's not your, your standard, oh, we develop lexicon, kind of, the stuff that you always hear about in AI and whatnot. He also um, deals with that, that, that kind of stuff very, very, very critically. And so, I can I can only recommend I'm I'm trying to I have a, a clear statement to make because I'm still digesting I I spent the last hour reading before I got online so I'm still in the process of trying to to sort and sift and get something out of it but it's a to me he goes from from a, a mimetic kind of he says there's three transitions in in consciousness that we have to get to where we are and the first one you know the first one is actually how do we be how do we get from apes to humans? That, and so he talks about episodic memory and the episodic existent being, and then, and then moving in from episodic to mimetic. And he does have a different view. It's not just pure imitation. It's imitation with a meaning, if you could do that. And I just got to the other one where he goes from mimetic to mythic. That's where language shows up. Because I thought all along he was waiting, you know, he talks a lot about uh, anthropological finds and, you know, ho hominoid apes and Homo erectus and Homo habilis and whoever it is and whether we have vocal cords and this, that and whatnot. But he does get to the point where he actually goes over, and this reminded me a lot of Meru, um, out of gesturing language will come and once we do that, well, we take off kind of thing. And, and so there's this combination of, you know, growing brain size, maybe all those biological things. He's, he's got that very materialistic biological bench to him, which is, which is fine. But, but he does point to the fact that there is something inherent in how we got to be different from apes. And language plays a huge role in that, but not in the usual way that we understand or are told most of the things that we read that the role that language plays, I have, you know, it's the Warfian thing. Well, no, it's not that at all. You know, it's not even close <laughs> kind of thing. And, and so that's why I said, well, well, this is actually, this is something to, to stop and think about um, in that regard. You know? So if you can, you have to wade through a whole lot of um, anthropological uh, finds and, and whatnot, but in archeological things, but, but this basic premise that we probably go from, you know, imitation to, to gesture. And I had, I had to think of Talus because Talus said that the reason that, that humans separated from apes as soon as they have had an opposable thumb. And once you start making tools and keeping tools, not just finding tools and using them, but actually making them, you, you, you change everything about your interaction with the world, how you actually engage what you think is whatever reality out there. And the moment that you start doing that, that spreads rapidly amongst those who are like you, you know, because you pass that. And, and he provides a bit of a mechanism for how that happens and why gesturing becomes very important. This precursor to language, is, which is exactly what what's Tenen, for example, in, in, in his uh, uh, work points to and said it's probably gestural, then vocal. You know, that, that comes later. And he spends a lot of time talking about that. So there was, there were these really interesting overlays from, I'm going to say, three different people coming from three very different perspectives um, and arriving at a very similar kind of point, you know, because we can all look at something or we can read the same words and we see something different, but arriving at the same point, um, 
from uh, somewhat different paths. So I, I'll, I'll throw that on the reading list. Um, I know you guys got nothing to do in free time. <laughs> By the way, I picked up the Tenon's book. I haven't. <laughs> you did? Oh, okay. Well, <laughs> Latin for punishment, Jeffrey. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm think. I tell you, I'm thinking of retiring just so I can. I can so you can. can list. <laughs> so you can read. <laughs> well, I can't tell you how long I thought about retirement before I actually got to it. But <laughs> all right. But that's my reading suggestion, or today, or wherever, whatever time it is where you guys are. Uh, just there's a book written by a man named Jeffrey Beatty about it's about nonverbal communication. But his argument is we developed language so that we could keep our hands free to do the real business, which is ingesting. Uh -huh. so the verbal <laughs> language was developed in order to keep open the you open that gesture elements it's interesting, That's an interesting uh, take on it too the book called visual thought mm -hmm. yeah i don't have enough reading either. <laughs> <laughs> well i'm sure that's how i i know i was reading an anthropologist i think it's i think we've studied a lot about the brain and cognitive science is into the brain <laughs> But, you know, there's no such thing as a brain without other brains. And I think it's what's happening in between that's crucial. I know uh, an anthropologist, he, I think he's right, he was writing on the social brain. I can't remember his name. Um, but he was talking about being in a, somewhere he'd never, he didn't know the language of this. Uh, and he was on a road and he met a man who was was deaf deaf and uh he was a deaf mute mm. and um so here they are they don't share any language they don't share a culture either this is in new guinea or someplace like that and um he said they started to gesture and grunt and mime and he he got a lot of information he said the guy was going to another village there was a woman who was dying of cancer and uh he was her he was a, a relative of hers and um, he was talking about her illness or he was communicating. Now this is a man who's deaf and mute and he's communicating to someone from a different culture and they have no language. But the, this anthropologist was just uh, found that a very illuminating experience to realize how much we can pick up from one another non-verbally and how probably the nonverbals are, are much more important than what is actually said. It's all the, it's always the tone, the rhythm, the, you know, where the person's breathing, the, 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 their pupils, whether they're dilated or not, you know, all those kinds of nonverbal things and gestures that um, have an impact that's very uh, large. Um, so that we can tell when someone's mixing messages, like, I love you, God damn it. Well, you know, that hand and that fist <laughs> and the verbal message, I love you, don't match. <laughs> so these are the kinds of things, These these are this uh, could be a meta message or it could be a para message, but these different kinds of messages, we, um, we in intuitive, we, we know when someone's confused or mixing messages or, or lying. Uh, we have our, our, our gut usually uh, lets us know. So I think that's a fascinating um, topic. And, I, and I've and i read a little bit. I've read A Mind So Rare. I haven't read the one that you're reading, um, but I've read another one. And uh -huh. It's a, it's, it's a think, fascinating topic. I think what you're saying, too, is also the problem with the Turing test, that... Uh -huh. uh, Serial critiques, Kelly critiques here as well. Is that does he understand Chinese? The guy in the, in the Chinese, yeah. But it's also, I think, the problem that we're facing or kind of getting into historically at this time is that virtual virtuality is taking over, and 
we're going to have to make distinctions between what's real or who is real and what's not, what's a projection, what's a manipulation, a distortion, uh, you know, an illusion. Like that's what the whole fake news you know, phenomenon is about. Uh, I don't see that getting any better as the technology <laughs> increases because we're able to model a lot of things about human behavior and then to use that modeling to manipulate human behavior. And the people who have gotten smart about that and who have gotten their hands on the processing power mm -hmm. to use that uh, are able to really uh, capitalize on the relative, uh, you know, ignorance of, of every, and confusion <laughs> uh, of, of everybody else, and the collective, you know, chaos of evolutionary mm -hmm. and climat climatological uh, and social pressures. That, I think that gets kind of to the matter at hand or the, the matter of concern mm. is that although we're speaking on a philosophical and conceptual level, these ideas have a lot of real world applications mm. and those applications are what, gen, you know, are on the whole, what create the world that we live in. So drawing the connections, I think between the stuff happening in computer science, the stuff happening in social applied social research, the stuff happening in brain science, uh, and then the meta narratives that are disseminated through the media. Uh, how sorting all that out and getting clarity on how that all is, you know, playing out uh, to me is a, an important task. Actually, I, I don't think what we're talking about is connected to that. Uh, uh, purpose. Uh, <laughs> but it's going to take a while. I'm, I'm hearing the glitches again. They're after. They're, after. They're on. They're on. It. <laughs> They're scrambling scram my signal. <laughs> I really I like really what like you're doing here with the, with the, cos cos with the Cosmos, Cosmos Cafe. Cafe. I think these conversations are really generative. Really generative. I think it's somewhere, actually. I can't agree more. Yeah. Yep. Yep. I enjoy them anyway. The, the world the economic. Economic. Yeah, yeah. 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 We know. <laughs> the World Economic Forum, a quote. The balance, balance of, food, of food and trash will tip by 2050. There will be more trash in the sea than fish by 2050, according to the World Economic Forum. So I think the old days, you know, when they talked about fact and value, um, and that the facts that we gather are driven by what we value, I think that's, um, I think that's part of the, the modern worldview that you could separate fact and value in a real clean way. I don't think we can anymore. Um, so I believe that's what brings me forward and to deal with the uncertainty of, you know, what's going to happen here today. And I'm very perplexed by a lot of issues uh, that we're, we're dealing with. Um, but being collaborative and exchanging, uh, you know, our differences, uh, I think, you know, trying to stay in a, and, and open to new metaphors and, and different narratives. I believe this is a training. Um, and I, and it's also a pleasure. It's an aesthetic enjoyment or I wouldn't do it. So, you know, I'm just hoping that we can um, find ways of, uh, you know, of, of moving forward because I believe these possibilities and potentials, whatever, whether they're possibilities or potentials, I'm not sure, but I think, um, I've seen a glimpse in, in my own experience and the experiences of others um, that really persuades me that, uh, that, that we need some new models and, um, and to keep modeling, yeah. don't stop. <laughs> and when that model doesn't work anymore, we'll keep modeling. You know, I think this, we're just, we're map makers. We're, we're hardwired to do this. Um, so I think it's the, 
being able to um, let go of a map when it doesn't work anymore is it's it's pretty hard to learn. It's a great great benefit, I think. Well, oh. well, yeah. wonders never cease. <laughs> <laughs> Look who's here. <laughs> oh, we lost him. Yeah. <laughs> That's pretty spooky. <laughs> so when you said they were watching us, uh, Mark, <laughs> you meant dog. <laughs> <laughs> it seems so. Okay, maybe he'll show up again. But I, I, I just wanted to reinforce what Marco had just uh, said. Um, I, I see the biggest challenge in front of us is being able to sort and sift between, you can call it real and unreal if you like, or fake or non-fake or whatever, but, but that essential critical ability that, that I'm not going to say we once had, but it was at least cultivated. We have to critically think and we have to evaluate and look at sources and you know, all those little kinds of things uh, has taken on in, increased in intense meaning in the, in the, in recent times, because it is now, it is now the standard procedure to simply deny to provide alternative facts, you know, which is a notion I, I, I have, I find it mind boggling that someone can say that with a straight face and no one, even the person that's being talked to, doesn't challenge it. You know, what, what, what can conceivably be an alternative fact? Something's either a fact or it isn't a fact. But that we, that we tolerate those things. That, that, that's where I actually, that's my big heartburn, is that we tolerate things like that. We don't call bullshit when we see it. And, and so it gets propagated in, in a way that is probably disadvantageous for us all. Because the thing that we need to, you know, it's always been a matter of being able to sort and sift and find out what was biologically or survival relevant. And I don't, I don't know if we're able to do that as a species anymore. I, I think way down deep inside we probably are. And there's enough people that, you know, we don't know about that are doing it. But if you look at the, you know, what you see or what's presented to you, and um, uh, it doesn't seem like it's that way. And when I talk to a lot of people, they, they make absolutely zero distinction between anything that is real or not real, substantial or insubstantial. Uh, most people I know don't get the point of most things that are said. I can't tell you how many times and you know, I'm reading through my 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 Facebook feed and somebody posts something which oh, I think is kind of a humorous little meme kind of thing, and then all of a sudden you I'm looking at the comments and I'm going, what did these people see? What was that that they thought they saw? Because it wasn't like that at all. And of course, the person that, that posted it and thought it was kind of cute is all of a sudden diluting just under this avalanche of criticism for for doing things. I'm going, oh boy. It's time to sort your friends list out, you know. I, and and that's, that's what concerns me, that, you know, we're losing this ability. And there's not enough of us. I'll, I'll say that I can still do that to a, a certain extent. But I see that, you know, here in the board, because we get together and talk about things and exchange views. And even when we don't agree, we end up saying, okay, well, I, I kind of get where you're coming from. Um, you know, and that's, that's also something I don't see in the, in the broader or the wider um, surface of interactions that I that I encounter. Oh, he's back. So Thank I'm very you. grateful. Um, I'm very grateful that yeah. we're having this opportunity. I I, I am as well. Yeah. Uh, uh, in a couple of weeks, we're speaking with Jordan Brown, who's a filmmaker, uh, mm. and created uh, the documentary called "Stare into the Lights, My Pretty." It's something like, uh, it's about screen culture. And it's about the effects, the soci mm. social effects, social psychological effects of um, the you know this internet and 
uh, digital technology. Uh, I think that you know that plays into this um, disintegration you're you're pointing to, Ed, uh, yeah. in our capacity for discourse. I like that movie. It was good. Mm. Yeah, me too. <laughs> it, I'm glad you're doing, arranging that. Mm. Um, next week, uh, I confirmed this, this with Caroline. We're uh, talking about this white paper. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> Democracy <laughs> Earth Foundation. Uh, it's called the Social Smart Contract. It's an open source white paper that was it was written by a community of um, coders, uh, thinker, you know, p- people working on this issue of how do you have how do you have a democratic process in a distributed, egalitarian, decentralized manner using using digital technologies to further civic goals? Yep. Uh, and so um, they are uh, about to release a um, uh, a coin, uh, basically a, a kind of token system for uh, enabling um, distributed democratic voting. Uh, for enabling those kinds of systems with the verifications that you would need to uh, get around the problem of centralized um, uh, control over these processes. Uh, I think these are connected. I think the consciousness question is connected to the social question, the political question, the economic question, the technological question. Like They're all related. They're all of one thing. And I, you know, I know I, what I'm really interested in is the possibility of seeing it, the different sides of it, but also being able to tell a story. Mm. Like what's happening on this, on this larger scale and you know, what are, what is our, what are our roles with respect to that? And so I feel like these conversations are, they are a kind of training they are kind of preparatory because we're working out what we think mm. and we're uh, making distinctions. Uh, that are going to be useful, I think, later, kind of honing our our, our perceptual and our synthetic uh, capacities and our collaborative capacities, too, uh, because to, to see something clearly uh, clearly takes an ensemble of minds, more than just one brain looking at it. Uh, That's right. So mm-hmm. I, I really I appreciate you showing up and I... I want to get. I want pe- other people to hear this and think yeah. about it and respond to it and uh, propagation to occur. I, I think that that we could do that, and um, so that was some of the download that I was getting from my ear tinnitus kind of thing experience earlier. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I should go. I have things to do. It's been a couple of hours. Um, but Thank we have you. Doug here. Doug, do you want to say hi, or were you expecting to use the line uh, at this time? I'm, I'm just listening in, and uh, I, I expected uh, either to be at the tail end or creating my own little video that you're going to delete it later. But uh, glad I could make it. Uh, <laughs> yes. Sounded like a good conversation. <laughs> <laughs> it was a lot of fun. We want to hear your response. You'll, you'll be the meta observer. Well, Mm -hmm. I I did have an hour meeting that was boring, as I mentioned. But then the second hour, my wife was in her own meeting for the, the, she's treasurer of the Quaker group. And so I was, we went to the local library there and I I checked out a book called Big Mind, which is on collective intelligence. I think it came out recently, Um, but it's, it's a good book. I might have some, a few things to say about that, but it has a few good models, um, I'm sure that'll tie in here, but no, it sounds like uh, everybody's ready to go. Look like your your wife is uh, putting together the theory of everybody, which I couldn't yeah. check out on my mobile phone, but that'll be something to check out for everybody leaving now. Yeah, we're working on integrating podcasting into that site, and then all, it will also be in Metapsychosis. And I got a domain name over the weekend, Cosmos.media, for uh, just a generic placeholder at this point. Uh, for okay. me. And clearly, my my uh, Cosmos host Namaker here needs to be. A, I obviously have to log out after I made the attempt to check out the the podcasting thing. So, I want um, people to be able to just explore what they think and put it out and have this process that we're having here. We're sort of modeling in a microcosm what I think other people could do, and um, I'm very excited about some of the developments um, in even in like technology space. 
Um, this will come later, but uh, I, I purchased a, a box. It's called a Holo port, <laughs> and it's a it's going to be it's part of a network of distributed computing that is being um, created by an organization called Holo, uh, and it's really interesting because it, it seems to be a genuinely distributed uh, kind of system that is act- actualizing the peer-to-peer idea uh, in its data structure. Uh, and it's another conversation, you know, that, that we'll get to. But I think that there are, you know, if we can multiplex between these different dimensions of reality, uh, we can get to that meshwork thing that, you know, one of the first things, first things you talked about, Jeffrey, where there is, um, you know, we do create, a, we, we, ver- we start to create other world experiences. That's grandiose. It's a huge topic, but I think that's ultimately kind of what we are about here. <laughs> what we have to do, what's really called for is we have to create, we have to recreate this, this is way too grandiose, way too woo woo, but we have to recreate the world essentially. Uh, and, um, and that, you know, has, has to be from the love, from language to technology, to social systems, to decision-making in, in distributed a, groups. Your plan for the cosmos co-op. To play a role in this, to play a role. <laughs> that's it. <laughs> to play its role. Uh, that's, I think, all we can, all one can do. Mm-hmm. Okay. Thank you, gentlemen. I learned a lot today. I learned a lot. Thank you very much. Always. All right. Very stimulating. I did too. Bye bye. Okay. Take care. Next time. Whenever. Bye. <laughs>